The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Southeast Linux Fest 2012. Uh, this is Clint Savage from the Goose Linux Project. I'm good to go, all right? Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, so let me just start off. Uh, if you guys don't know who I am, my name is Clint Savage. I've been around uh, for a long time. Um, as it says here, I, I own a little site called SexySexyPenguins.com. That's where I blog. And I participate a, a lot of the time in the Fedora Project. So if you've heard of the Fedora Project, um, that's kind of where I hang out a lot. Um, and I also work on the Goose Project, which is the new one I want to talk about. So I'm going to stand down here because there's only, what, 20 people in the room, and you guys are all spread out. And so uh, first off, if you have questions, just blurt them out. I'll try to repeat them. Um, so that the camera catches it, but if you have questions or interest um, in that regard, or comments, or things that you want to, you know, bring up, please let me know. I'm, I'm interested in hearing feedback. So let's talk about why uh, we're standing here in the room. Let's talk about Goose itself. Um, the Goose project started with a request. Anybody who knew Dag Weirs is? Have you ever heard of him before? He's just the famous guy that runs, um, what is it, the RPM Forge and the DAG repo and a bunch of other things in, in the, in the uh, Red Hat community, in the, in the CentOS community. And what he said is he said, hey, you know, I'm sick and tired of CentOS. Well, he didn't really say that, but something close. He said, anyone feel, wanting, willing to fund a RHEL rebuild project with timely releases and a transparent process? And he po posted this little hashtag, and I thought this was really neat, not CentOS. So <clears throat> a couple weeks later, my friend Derek Carter, he was actually sitting right here, and I and a couple other guys um, who are a member of uh, the Utah open source community, which is out in Utah, which is where I'm from. And uh, he, he said, you know, this would be really cool. So we sat down and we talked for, I don't know, a couple hours. It was really fun, and we really had a good time talking about it. And we said, what would it take to rebuild Red Hat Enterprise Linux or something to that effect? How would we take the source RPMs that Red Hat gives us and do basically what CentOS does? but in an open, transparent way. And what we said was, you know, there's a really cool project out there. It's called the Fedora Project. We knew all about it, because we've been participating in it for a few years. And he says, that's probably the good example of how to run a distro, is Fedora. So we started looking at it, and we said, what's neat about Fedora? We like, we like the other distributions. One of the things I liked about Fedora was there's a lot of contribution from people who just come into the community. It's very transparent. People can complain about whatever they want. They can you know, go work on whatever they want. There's a lot of cool opportunities there. And we wanted to produce, produce that sort of thing as well. We also wanted it to be collaborative and a few other things. And so we started thinking these ideas. And from that, there's my only transition, is the Goose Project. It's an enterprise Linux rebuild project. So it basically is what CentOS is doing. We want to do it with um, open, transparent processes. And we really want to build what's called the Enterprise Linux Rebuild ecosystem, if you will. You know, Red Hat gets a lot of benefit from this, actually, if you look at it from that perspective. They actually get a lot of bug fixes from CentOS. They get a lot of bug fixes from Scientific Linux. We want to grow that. And that's really our goal, is to make it easy for people to actually participate in this process. If you're interested in it, we want to get you on board and join us, and that sort of stuff. So of course, this is the first question everybody asks, right? Why, why in the world do you build this operating system? CentOS already does that, right? Anybody have any reasons that they think about why we'd want to do this? Yeah? 6.0. 6 we're going to talk about that in a second. Anybody else have any thoughts? It's not a community-run thing. I apologize. A small corner for people. It's not community-run. Anybody else have any ideas? OK. Yeah, so the other thing is, there's other distributions that do this. Not just us, we're, we're pretty actually pretty new to this. We've been at it about a year. Um, but Scientific Linux has been doing it for a really long time. There's another one called Clear OS. It's from a company called Clear uh, something. They're in Salt Lake, They're based out of south of us. They're just called Clear, maybe. Um, and then another one called Ascendos, and they started just before we did. Yeah, there's lots. White box. Yeah, there's tons of these, right? There's probably 10 or 12 of them. And our real goal here is to really kind of combine resources and help grow that enterprise Linux rebuild 
uh, environment. Oh yeah, who said the CentOS 6 thing? Yeah, so here's, here's a really cool article. Uh, this gentleman who wrote this from standalone sysadmin, he said, here's the releases. So he took RHEL and he said, how long did it take from RHEL 4 to come out to CentOS 4? And this is number of days. So RHEL 6 came out in November of 11, I think it was, something like that. It took 243 days for CentOS 6.0 came out. There's a lot of reasons for that. Here's a couple. This is my favorite quote from Dag Weir's. No, no, you have it all wrong. The C in CentOS means closed, the big smiley face. And, and then there's a gentleman by the name of Johnny Hughes. He's one of the core guys inside CentOS. And he says, you know, the one thing about this is we don't really build it by, by the community, we build it for the community. And I, and I really like how he spelled by. He spelled it that way. So that was my, my very much entertaining uh, note here. But, but the point here, what is the point here that I'm making? Right? It's about the community, right? We want to build the community up. We want to get people involved in building an operating system that they understand. Now, if you're a Red Hat user or a Fedora user, CentOS user, things like that, and you wanted to know how a distribution gets put, put together, that's basically what we figured out. We were like, well, we don't want to see how a distribution gets put together. So we're going to do this. And we, we come up with a, what's called a community of contributors. And I want to kind of focus on this for a second and talk about contributors themselves. Now, I'm not saying users aren't important, because they are. They're vastly important, and they're really, really important. But one of the things that I find about projects, and uh, by the, a gentleman by the name of uh, Carson Wade, who's part of the Fedora Project, came up with this diagram. And what it talks about is how community contribution affects the actual process and the growth of a community, or how the direction, or any sort of influence. So down here in the bottom of this diagram is consumers. There's 80% of them, right? Everybody's just kind of a user. They talk about it occasionally, tell their friends, that sort of thing. But they don't really do a lot other than that, just using it. Then we've got participants at about 15%. This is on the user side, right? They're like, OK, this is cool. And I want to use this project. I want to use this. I'm going to tell my friends. And I'm going to get a couple people involved. So they basically you know, do a bunch of work here. And the last ones are contributors. They're a really small group of people. In fact, our core group of people is basically four people. We have a few more contributors than that. And I'll talk about that a little later. But those 5% or so of the community base influence about 80% of the project, right? That's what we're basically talking about, is we want to open up the community to contributors so people can come in and, ta and see and, and help influence the direction of where we want to go with this. There's a lot of options here, tons of things that I can't think of that I'd love to see other people help us with. And so that's kind of an idea that I've been thinking about for a long time. We're really interested in getting contributors. We're really interested in hearing about you know, what you guys want to see out of the project. And if you want to come help us, that's really what we're asking to have you do. So goals. Some of the things that we think about with regard to goals are, OK, I've got this project. It's been really cool. It's been fun to play with. But you know, I've rebuilt an operating system. OK, cool. That was fun. Anybody rebuilt an operating system before? Anybody built an operating system before? Come on, Paul, raise your hand. OK. Anybody? Anybody done Linux from scratch? That's a fun one, right? How much of the innards did you learn? Tons, right? OK. These people are still awake. It's after lunch, I understand. They always put me at 1.30. It's like everyone's sleeping. So number one, transparency. This was really important to us. We really wanted people to see where we, you know, where we are going and where we came from and why we're, getting, why we're doing this. And so I'm here, sorry? Yeah, how the sausage was made, that's a good way to say it. So how do we perform tasks? How do we get involved and actually show people what we're doing? So we're spending a lot of time documenting our processes. We're spending a lot of time writing code that's hopefully readable and has things like that in it. We're not there yet, definitely not. We're, we're failing miserably at that. But a couple things that we do really well, we have regularly weekly, regular weekly meetings every week in Pound Goose Project on Freenode. And we actually post those online every week. Yeah, so in a little more than a year, we've missed two weeks. We, we have tons of logs up there. You can read everything that we've ever done. And most of our communications are there or by email. Sorry? Every decision we've ever made. Every yep. Week, uh, yep. Everything we've done in the project is on the blog. So hopefully, you know, this will wake you up, um, community, right? One of the things that I think about CentOS is I think it's a great project. 
And I think it's fun, and there's like a core of eight guys that work on the project regularly, and I think it's fun for them until people start badgering them, right? When CentOS 6 came out, or before it came out, there was like hundreds of people asking when's it gonna come out, when's it gonna come out every day. I read the, the list. One of the things that we wanna be able to do is we wanna be able to have that community say, hey, when's it gonna come out? And we're gonna say, well, when you come help us build it. Right? When you come help us build it, that's our goal. We want to build it by the community, and we want to build it for the community. Because that's really the goal is, you know, you come and help us, or if you want to, um, or you just come and use it. But you can give us feedback either way. And that's really the goal is we want contributions and feedback. A couple other goals. Uh, number, one, number three is up to date. So earlier I showed that diagram of CentOS and how out of date it was. So 120 days is a lot of time. Actually, I'm hoping for more like 60 days and two weeks for minor releases, but right now these are our goals, 120 days, four months after they come out. We want to come out with our own. Uh, there's no way we've made that anywhere near that yet, but we're getting there. And minor releases from 6.1 to 6.2 or 6.2 to 6.3, we want to be able to come back in 30 days. Uh, another comment here, um, how many of you guys see how fast security fixes are coming from like CentOS or Scientific now? Did anybody see the blog post the other day? What do you say, like 72 hours? It's these three days. Three days. I'd like to get it down to one day, maybe 48 hours at most. I'd like to see security fixes be in there as fast as we can possibly get them in, into the updates repository. Four, can you do this? Is it forkable? What we want to do is give you the opportunity to build your own. We don't need to do this ourselves. In fact, if you want to start your own project, you can pretty much take what we've got modify some logos, and you can do it. That's our goal, right? So we want to be able to properly license it, make sure we have docs that are properly licensed um, for you to actually use, and of course, documentation. Anybody like writing docs? Yay, I got one person. Come join us. Uh, and I'm gonna keep pitching, you know, come join us, come join us, come join us. That's, you know, that's the whole deal. And number five, how many of you guys participate in a community where you don't get to make a decision? Good. Come help us make decisions too. What's that? That's work. That's work. Yes, I understand. It does say meritocratic flexibility. It does say you have to work first, but you get to help us decide and where it goes, and you get to do the work you want to do to make that happen. Oh. That's your job? They pay you big, big bucks to make your own operating system? No. Oh. They're saying they're participating in a community where they don't get to make decisions. Oh. I, I meant like an open source community. <laughs> well, that's, that's, I understand that one. I, I do have a job as well. I, I understand. So if you do the work, you can decide. That's really our, our five basic goals. And these are the things that we want to focus on. And we want you guys to get involved and help us. And that's really our, our query here. Um, but there's a whole bunch of pieces that go with this. So I want to show you our tools and our infrastructure and the pieces that we talk about. And this is going to take a little bit longer because there's a lot more to this. Um, this is the stuff that I'm really excited about and the stuff that we've written um, in the last year or so. So let's talk about it first. One of the things that we do is we decided that we didn't want to maintain the infrastructure for a lot of the pieces if we could help it because we just didn't have enough manpower. Now we do have some hardware and we have some other pieces, but what we did decide is let, let's, let's just use GitHub. How many of you guys have a GitHub account? Anybody? Okay. How many of you guys like Git? Okay, good. At least a few people. If you don't like Git, Get over that. Um, that was a really bad joke. Um, but GitHub actually hosts a lot of our infrastructure. Let me give you a, just a quick uh, overview of GitHub because I think it's really cool and I just want to go over it really quick um, the other way. So if you haven't ever seen GitHub before, this is our organization, Goose Project. Uh, let me see if I can get just to the organization. Yeah. And what you might notice here is we have a lot of um, repositories. We have 17 public repos. These are actually our open source and free repos. Uh, most of them are GPL2, I think. There might be one that is APL or something, Apache license. I didn't write all of these, but there's a bunch in here that we've modified. For instance, Goose logos, we had to modify that from Red Hat logos because we can't use their licensing and their, their trademarks. So we made our own. Um, our main repository is where we keep most of our code, but we do actually have a bunch of other ones for release engineering, quality assurance, uh, our website, Go Goose Release, which is our release package, our planet, which we actually have a planet. If you wanted to read that, it's planet.gooseproject.org. Um, 
Skein, which is my favorite one. Skein is actually uh, the project manager, which basically uh, opens up source RPMs, extracts them, and uploads them to repositories to be built. So it's pretty cool, and, and it's a lot of fun there. And then um, we have a Meatbot uh, fork because Derek here wrote a Meatbot that sends emails automatically for us, which is kind of cool. So if you're interested in, in seeing that, you can check out our, our online stuff. We also have 2200 or 2139 repositories over here. These are all of the RPMs in source form that we've extracted from upstream. So I'm going to start referring to them as upstream. Um, so if you don't understand what that means, that means Red Hat, um, because they're the ones that generated it originally. So we have 20, 2139 repositories. That's pretty cool. And we store that all on GitHub. GitHub does have some limits. Uh, they have, I think it's a limit of like 300 megs for all your repositories inside an organization. How many of you guys know how big an RPM is? Or how big they can get, right? So there's a tarball inside of every source RPM. So we don't store our tarballs in GitHub. We separate them out. We put them in what's called a look-aside cache, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. That's stored on our own infrastructure. Additionally, we use Python heavily. That's actually our preferred language of choice. Uh, you can use you know, shell scripting or anything but Ruby. Um, that would be fine with me. No, I'm just kidding. You can use Ruby if you like. Um, but we won't take it. Well, actually, we will. But uh, So Skane, as I mentioned, um, does a lot of things. And I'll show you some uh, workflows with that in a minute. Grapple, which is a Git hook inside of, Koji, inside of uh, GitHub, which automates our builds to Koji, which we're going to talk about in a second. Another little tool called Repo Sort. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on is how do you build RPMs with dependencies inside a tree? And how do you resolve all of those dependencies to build a bootstrap to actually get an operating system up? That's like the hardest problem, actually. It took us about three months to do that for a lot of reasons. And if you want to talk about those, we can talk about it after. We also use um, Python GitHub 2, working on GitHub 3 right now. Um, that's their version 2 and version 3 of the GitHub API that isn't written in Python that we interact with to create repositories. This is all automated. I don't write, there's no way I could have created 2193 or 39 RP, uh, repositories on my own. Uh, lastly, we use Koji, and I'm actually going to kind of leave Koji out for a minute. We'll come back to it. But Koji's our build server. And if you've ever seen the Fedora project at all, go to koji.fedoraproject.org or koji.goose.linux.org, and you'll see a Koji instance there. So let's kind of talk about how that works. How many of you guys have gone to like Red Hat's FTP site where they have source RPMs? Because right? they're required by law, right? by copyright law, to, re to, to, to distribute these due to the GNU public license. In a lot of cases, they're just really nice about it. So they have upstream source RPMs somewhere, and we download them. We put them into a local data store somewhere on our box, and we use a tool called Skane, as I mentioned earlier. Skane does a thing called extract, takes the RPM name in source form, and does two things. One, it creates a local Git repository on my machine and a look-aside cache locally as well. From that, I can upload to my look-aside cache the tarball. It does a SHA-256 sum, SHA sum of it and puts that into the local Git repository into a file called sources, and that's how we can verify it later on. It gets uploaded to this lo local or look aside cache, and then from the local Git repository, we can do a scan push for the project name, and it will push that to the Git repository for us. So a lot of the pieces are already in place using scan. There is actually a th another piece called scan import, which does all three of those steps for you. So you don't have to type all three of those, because I got tired of typing it 2,100 times. So we've got our GitHub repository, and we've got our look aside cache, and from that. We're going to build a source RPM again so that we can prove that it's been built properly on our infrastructure and that it's not been built by anybody else. And secondly, we're going to build binary RPMs. So here's the next slide. Oh, that didn't come out very well. So Goose Project GitHub, there's a little hook in there, like I mentioned earlier, called Grapple. And when it hits there, it automatically does a post-receive commit hook. Have you guys ever used Git to that extent? It sends a message over to our server, which runs Grapple. Grapple runs a cron job every five minutes, and it sees, is there any new committed um, packages? If there are, it tries to call Koji and run them, okay? So this is step six. It says cron runs every five minutes, calls Grapple, and then seven says Koji build, and then the uh, tag and the commit message, or the commit hash, excuse me. 
from that, it initializes what's called a mock true. How many of you guys use mock before, anybody? Okay, a couple people. Let me explain what mock is. Anybody try to build an RPM before? Okay. Mock makes it easier. It's my opinion. Um, so building RPM requires lots of dependencies, right? And it, it basically it does all of the uh, environment setup for you. It installs all the, the, the build root and everything to make sure that mock actually, that your RPM actually works and meets all of the dependencies. If you did it on your own machine, sometimes you install things and then you forget about them, right? So mock takes care of that and says, we're going to clean environment. We're going to make sure that all things you install, and then when you try to run it, if it doesn't compile, you can fix that by making a new source RPM, or in this case, a, a spec file, and it will generate the new RPM from it. So it builds a, it's, a, it's all built in a cheroot, so it's all its environment. Then what it does is it calls this thing called make sources. Now you can change this a little bit, but that's the default. What make sources does is it goes and checks out our remote GitHub repository for that particular package, pulls it down into the shroot, and downloads the proper package, puts it into the shroot, and verifies it's SHA-256 sum. If it didn't verify it, what would we have a problem with? We'd be in trouble, right? Because someone could do a man-in-the-middle attack on us or things like that. So we want to make sure that that's valid. Now, I've done the best I can to configure that and make sure that it doesn't get, in, you know, somebody hacking into it and breaking it, but in terms of this, it tries its best, and we might need to improve this, and if somebody has ideas on it, I'd love to hear them. And then it builds the source RPM. So it does a, an RPM build dash BS and builds a source RPM. Once the source RPM is built, we've basically done the work to take that, that, that package from the previous slide, download it, and do all this, and build it into a source RPM that we can now build into a package we can actually use in real life. So from that, we do another mock to root, and we build the binary RPMs from that source RPM that we just built. This is all done with Koji automatically. It's really nice, because if I had to do all this by hand, I would cry. Thank you, Fedora, for writing this, and Red Hat for writing this, because it's been great. One other thing that, that Koji does that's really important is it generates repositories. So after the RPM has been built, it gets tagged. And you can have many, many tags, and each of these tags is basically a repository of RPMs. From that, you tag the build and it regenerates the repository, puts the new RPMs in it, and now you have a new dependency tree that you can use to build a new package. So the tricky part here is, I got package one, I got package two, I got package three. How do I get all the dependencies in between those resolved and sort that out? And that's something we haven't actually solved yet. We're working on it. But we haven't got all the dependency tree structure figured out yet. Only the build root. Okay, last, last slide on this. It's boring, right? Everybody bored? Or is it actually interesting? I hope it's interesting. I get excited about this. It's fun for me. So another thing that's really important here to note is that we have another process. We actually have to sign our RPMs and tell you that, you know, you trust, if you trust us, you can trust the RPMs that we built. So each of these different things in Koji can actually get signed with a, th with a tool called SIGL. This is another Fedora project that we borrowed because we love them and they're really nice to us. And nice to anybody who wants to learn how to use it. This is really alpha software, but it actually works really, really cool. So it has two basic parts. It has a server and a client. And the client and the server really never talk to each other. They talk over the bridge. And this basically is a way to keep everything locked away in like a less accessible machine and then you only make queries over the bridge and you actually have passphrases inside of there that are never seen. So the SIGL admin inside the server knows the passphrases and nobody else does. So if I wanted to do this, I would get a client, I'd create an account, or I'd have the admin create me an account, and then I'd ask to sign it. It would ask for my passphrase, which would then unlock the passphrase inside the server and then sign those RPMs. A lot of process there, but essentially it's trying to hide the the um, passphrase from anybody else to get it and steal it from you. So we don't want to let that out. Once they're signed, they're pushed back to Koji into a signed directory, and then they have the uh, key ID from, the, G from the, R the GPG key that you used. And then they generate repositories again, just like they did before. Um, so that they have the signed RPMs in there. And then we use a tool called MASH. Anybody heard of MASH before? Okay, so MASH makes more repositories. Kind of seems like a waste. Why would we make repositories if we already have repositories in Koji? Anybody heard of multi-lib? 
Multi-lib's a pain in the butt, but it's kind of cool at the same time because you can build one source RPM or spec file and you can get tons of different RPMs from it and different architectures, right? So that's the value of it. But what it does is it says, okay, well, we're only supporting these two architectures right now, 386 and 684, x86, 64. But we're going to mash them, and some of the packages in 386 need to be in the 64-bit repository. So we'll mash them together. Mash does it automatically for us and figures it out. We don't have to do anything. So now these are our public repositories. These are actually where we store everything. We mash them there, and they're inside our everything repository because that's all the RPMs that we have. And that's basically it. So if you look on koji.gooseproject.org slash releases, You'll see sketchy, and this is actually wrong, I gotta fix it. It'll be 60 slash beta dash RC number. That's our beta. And then when we have a release, which we don't have a golden goose yet, there's my funny joke for the day, um, it'll be in 6.0, okay? Lastly, and finally we're almost done, Pungy. Pungy does all the hard work that Anaconda Runtime used to do to make you an ISO. So if you want to have a DVD release or a CD release or a live CD or anything, those sorts of things, um, Pungy mostly does that. It does all the work for you. You just have to send, send it a couple pieces of information. Um, in the mash, you have to send it a comps XML, which has all the group information about Yum and make sure that all the gr groups are set up. And then Pungy can actually generate uh, an installer CD or, or DVD from that information. So now that I've gone through all the boring stuff, everybody awake still? Woohoo, that was awesome. All right. So where have we gotten to in one year? So we started this project back in April last year. So it's been a little more than a year. I wrote these slides for another conference last time and I've added a few to it, which it's been kind of fun to see the progression of this project. And we're interested in sharing progress with you guys and interest in hopefully interesting you in getting involved and seeing how we can go the next year, because I'd like to get a lot further. So currently we have 14 contributors five of which have actually made more than two commits. Uh, three of them are in the room here. They're right here along this side. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our contribution is in setup and configuration of our infrastructure, and we're working on automating that because Koji and MASH and those sorts of things are pain to set up, but you can automate them, and that's actually really easy. And we've already, I've already done most of the work to make Koji automated, so you can set up your own Koji infrastructure in a short period of time. And that goes back to yeah, that goes back to our focability goal. Another question on that, uh, or other comment on that. Anybody go to the SALT presentation earlier today? Nobody? One person, okay. We wrote it all in SALT. Koji's in SALT. The new one I just wrote, and it's in our development bra uh, branch of uh, the Bootstrap repository on GitHub. So it's already public. And that's one of our other goals too, right? Transparency, wanna make sure you guys can see it and fork it. So please fork it, fix it, you know, bug fix, whatever. What? I did it all in Salt like two weeks ago. What? Yep. Wait, you gave me six weeks off, so I did work. I did work. Um, so anyway, so five of these contributors have made more than two commits. Please come be one of those contributors. We'd love it. Um, simple things that you can do, uh, as an example, uh, are we have a website that is horrible and it sucks. Um, it's not updated and it needs a lot of work and love. Uh, we have a guy who had just joined us a week and a half ago who's doing our logo now, and he's redoing the logo. So you can see up here in the top right-hand corner, this little blue triangle thing. Yeah, I made that in five minutes, and that's our ugly current logo, right? Okay, it, it, it's, anybody here know what a skein is? Okay, anybody ever seen the ducks flying in a triangle? Yeah, that's called a skein, or geese in this case, right? Because we're the goose project. So that's where that came from, but that was my really crappy idea, and I, this other guy came up with a bunch better idea and hopefully uh, in, a, in a month or two we'll have that in the actual Golden Goose release. Moving on, 2200 packages. Like I said, 21, 39, something like that. Um, that actually turns out to be over 13,000 RPMs though, because each of those packages can generate more than one uh, RPM, binary RPM. Sometimes, some cases like 15 or 20. Um, a really good example of that is openoffice.org. I think there's something like 80 packages in that one. There are 80 RPMs that come out of that, which is uh, fun to watch build because it takes about an hour and a half and just kind of cranks away. So we have a lot of stuff in there. Most of our stuff is um, tracked in GitHub. As I mentioned before, we have what's called a vanilla branch and then we have a master branch. If we change anything from the upstream, we put, it in, we put the upstream's original in the vanilla branch and then we, then we modify the master branch and push that. 
That way we can keep them different. We can send diffs with uh, package um, or with bug bugs to Bugzilla um, for upstream. We currently have performed six alpha composes and actually two beta composes as well. Um, they're actually called sketchy, kind of like um, Fedora's Rawhide. Ours are really sketchy and I'm a little nervous all the time when they run because I'm not sure if they're gonna work. Um, and this is our latest TC6, but it's actually RC2 now of beta. Uh, it does have GPG assigned RPMs and so everything in our repositories are signed. Um, and I meant to update those and I apparently got behind and I didn't do it. So a couple of things that I want to point out here. One of the things that I think about a lot when I think about community and I think about that sort of thing is this enterprise Linux rebuild ecosystem, right? We have a lot of people out there doing lots of stuff. And one of the things I'd like to see is something like this where we have more hands and less work because we could do things like uh, collaboratively creating documentation, right? Who, who wants to create documentation five times over when basically it's the same documentation maybe with different logos or even not that, just some generic documentation? What about, what about sharing of upstream sources, like maybe they mirror ours and we mirror theirs, right? That'd be really cool, actually, because then I don't have to spend a ton of money trying to get more infrastructure. I just use theirs and they use mine. Uh, building QA tests. Everybody does basically the same concept here. Um, we're all building and rebuilding RHEL, so why not just do a bunch of QA tests and maybe somebody else come up with a cool idea, we can use theirs. If we come up with a cool idea, they can use ours. And another thing we thought about was cross-project backups, although GitHub does most of this for us right now. Uh, we definitely need backup, and we'd like to make it easier. So as I've mentioned like 50 times today, join us, please. I beg. I'll get down on my knee if, I, if need be uh, to come in there. What you need to do, anybody ever, a few of you mentioned GitHub. If you've never been on GitHub before, what you do is you go, it's called a fork. It generates a whole new GitHub tree for you. You make the change. There's a single change in one file that you make. Um, and you add your name to a, the contrib.rst file. And you then what's called a pull request. You go on, on the line on there, on your fork, you push pull request. It says, is this the right uh, commit that you want to change? You make sure that it's that modification in contrib. And you submit it back to us. Within a day or two, we'll add you to the contrib um, on Goose project on the GitHub and you'll be a contributor and you can start you know, filing bugs or working on code, pulling down and committing to the main repository. We give you that access right off the bat. And if you want to do more with the infrastructure, things like that, uh, we're working on processes and we'd love help trying to get those improved as well. So that's something we'd really like to see. Uh, but here's the thing. Anybody um, want a copy of Goose? Because I'd like to see you guys try it out. Where do we put those? Oh. Derek's got a bunch of CDs. They're live CDs, so if you want one, there's one over there, a couple people. Go hand them out, Derek. Man, no, I make you work. We got time. So if you don't, if you don't get a copy here, we've got 32-bit and 64-bit. They're live CDs, so they should actually come up into a GUI environment. We're gonna build one up here too in just a minute. Derek's gonna come and do it. So there's only 10, so if you run out, I'm sorry. But you can get it here at git.gooseproject.org. Don't download it during the conference. Do it from the Wi-Fi that you pay for upstairs. The $9.99 a night. <sighs> so ridiculous. These hotels, they always want to charge for internet access. So I'd love it if you guys would try it out. Let, it, let us know how you feel about it. Just come in and you know, leave a comment in, in Pound Goose Project or send us an email. We're on Google Groups. Um, we have a Google Groups, which is uh, not up there. But you can go to gooseproject.org and it's there. I need to put that up there. Uh, additionally, the slides are available on Speaker Deck. If you've never heard of Speaker Deck, that's something that I use a lot and I have a lot of my presentations up there. I think I have two versions of this one up there and it's a lot of fun to use that. They do a great job. Did we run out, Derek? We ran out of 64 bits. Yes. And I'll burn more if anybody wants them. We've got one more 32-bit. Anybody, anybody want it? It's just, a, it's just a live CD. You don't have to install it. Yeah, so stick it in and boot your machine and it'll come right up with it as long as you got CD first. And if you don't, if you want a USB, uh, live USB, I can do that as well. So Derek's going to take over now and uh, I'm, you can just disconnect me. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. 
the, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. CloudStack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. 
Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.